It's good to see you here at North Creek Church. Uh, if we've not met, my name is Mark. I'm lead pastor. We are in week three of our part two series of the book of Acts titled To the Ends of the Earth. Um, I trust that you've been enjoying our journey through the book of Acts. Yes? yes? Come on. Isn't God's word fun? It's so good. It's interesting. It's like, that's crazy. And I love it. I love studying that. And... Um, uh, before I jump into today's message, I do want to say that there is an email that went out uh, regarding just um, uh, Maggie Ball, and I want to not only highlight her, but um, there's a lot of tough stuff happening here at North Creek Church uh, with Chris Gray's mom passing. What an amazing funeral that was yesterday. Um, several people are having surgeries. Um, one of our students that used to attend here just didn't wake up, passed away, so just we're just Ah, just grieving so many uh, circumstances and stuff. But um, what I love about the church, it's not a program. It's not uh, what North Creek does. It's what you do and you are doing. Thank you so much for those who are just willing to take a meal. It's such a simple thing in someone's life that just needs a little bit of help. Uh, so uh, there's one that's officially out there, and my gut says there's a few more coming. So just prepare extra and just, you know, be Jesus' hands and feet. So thank you for caring uh, for one another at North Creek Church. Amen? Amen, amen. Well, we've been saying this for the past few weeks. I want to say it again for importance, okay? That really um, what we're preaching on is really what Luke, the author in the book of Acts, has grabbed a hold of as he's connected the words of Jesus. Pastor Chris said this last week. I want to say it again. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and it's on the screen. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on your life, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We have seen through the book of Acts, the church explode, just explode in people coming to faith in Jesus. And we also have seen in this passage that God kind of pushes the disciples a little bit, okay? Allowing them to face some persecution, allowing them uh, just their experience to be expanded. As, uh, as Peter has a vision and God says, rise and eat, and it's all the things he's not supposed to eat as a Jew. He's like, never, Lord. <laughs> and God says, don't, don't call what I have blessed. Um, I can't remember the wording, but just go back to a few weeks ago, <laughs> having that moment. Anyway, so God expands their understanding of the gospel and this idea of what it takes to get to the ends of the earth. As the Holy Spirit is poured out even on the Gentiles as he did in Acts chapter 2 on the disciples, suddenly they have a bigger picture. And so um, I want to make this point here that the early Christians didn't just hear what Jesus said and then jump in and do everything perfectly. Now they did to a point, And what I mean by that is when Jesus said go to the, the ends of the earth, they were like, absolutely, we're just going to naturally share Jesus with every single person we have the opportunity to share Jesus was, with. And so not only did they just do that, but God kind of kicks them, pushes them, uh, nudges them into a bigger perspective and situation because they thought they knew what Jesus meant. And he's like, nope, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. Not just, you're doing great in Jerusalem. Now let's, boom, let's get you out here. Here's some persecution, spreads them out. And as they go to other parts of the world, they tell people about Jesus. And so we see this progression that they needed a lot of help. And it was a both and kind of thing that God uses circumstances to open their minds to get them to move. Now, what I love about the chapters we're going to study today is the clarity by which God speaks he is very specific and very clear in these chapters. These chapters that we're going to study today are what's known as the first missionary journey. The first missionary journey that we have recorded in scripture. It's the first of three 
four if you count Paul's journey to Rome to testify about Jesus. But there's three specific missionary journeys that happens here in the chapters that we're about to study. And this is the first one. These chapters are why we have and support missionaries today. In fact, North Creek supports 16. I know we've promo 12 for 12. That is just what we do as a hearing church. But when you add our deaf church, um, I say 16, but one is an organization that actually covers multiple families. So it's really hard to quantify some of these statistics. So let's just go with 16 at North Creek Church. But in our network, which is the Assemblies of God in Washington, Northern Idaho, there are several hundred missionaries represented in our network. When you factor in our nation, there are thousands of Assemblies of God missionaries. When you factor in the entire world, there's multiple thousands. And that's just the Assemblies of God. Then you add the Baptists and the Presbyterians, all of these. There are, there are so many people who God has put a unique call on, who have said yes to go around this world to tell a different culture and a different people about the love of Jesus Christ. That is awesome. And it all comes from these two chapters. Our understanding of how the process of missions works. What we're trying to accomplish in getting the name of Jesus and who he is and what he's done to the world. We've created organization and structure of how we send missionaries out, what they are trying to accomplish. We want them to be effective, don't we? We don't want them just to go out and spin their wheels like a mouse on a, on a going nowhere. We want them to actually make a difference, right? So we have language even that helps us understand the different roles that missionaries play. This is also why we pray and ask God to send forth labors into the harvest field. And it comes from this example where God, through the Holy Spirit, has a moment where he's like, you guys are doing good. You got, I told you to go to the ends of the world. There's excitement there, but you're going to need a little help. So I'm going to be very clear and very specific. And it all begins in chapter 13, verse 2. I'm going to read that and then we'll Uh, get to our main scripture here in a moment. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, if you're new to the Bible, Saul is also known as Paul. One guy, okay? So God changes his name as he changed Jacob's name to Israel, as he changes Sarai's name to Sarah. And uh, anyway, he does this a lot. So Saul is Paul. Two guys. Barnabas, I'm going to say Paul for the rest of the service, just so you know um, who we're talking about. God allows us the privilege of figuring out his commands, of saying, when God says go into into the whole world, we get to kind of figure out what that's like for our own lives. I like to translate that a little bit because um, going into the world looks a lot like going to work, doesn't it? Like you, you wake up tomorrow morning and you're like going to work. Are you going to the world? Absolutely. Are you going to a world that needs Jesus, that needs to hear the good news about what Jesus has done? Yes. When you are in your neighborhood, do your neighbors need Jesus? Yes, mine do. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, when you are on the, the, the baseball field of your kids' team, whether it's little league or high school sports and all of the people around you. Are you in the world? Absolutely. And Jesus says, figure it out. Absolutely. Grab his command to go to the ends of the earth and go, my, my earth right now, my world, is pretty small, but I'm going to go there. And I'm going to be willing to share with Jesus. So this isn't an either or. Catch, catch what I'm saying. This is a both and. Everybody say both and. You get to figure it out. And sometimes the Holy Spirit shows up in your life and says, and I have a specific assignment for you. Here's some marching orders, okay? And so it's a both and where he calls us to a specific work. I want to give an awesome example because if you know Daniel and Aaron Rhonda, they're a, their family's a part of this church, they had this opportunity. They, they, they live here, they work here, they're a part of this church, they have the opportunity. They're in the East Coast right now. I just 
checked in on his Facebook, Aaron's Facebook. They were on a roof, redoing a roof. You're like, it's one house, but they're just like, Lord, he sent us. God had, said, I have a specific project for you, a specific assignment. And they said, absolutely, picked up their life. They flew there. And so what an amazing example, amen? amen. Helping rebuild from the hurricane. And we're going to have them share when they get back. So I'm really excited about that. But here's what I'm saying, that we, I, North Creek, the church, we still believe that the Holy Spirit is still calling people to the ends of the earth. And it comes from these two chapters. And so as you listen to today's sermon, I want to challenge you. I'm going to encourage you to pray this prayer to yourself, to ask God, would you send me? Would you call me? Would you help it be clear if I am to go to a specific task? We pray, we give, we go. Amen? And it's all because of what God did, is still doing, and it comes from these chapters. Let's jump in. Acts chapter 13. I want to begin at verse 1. And we're going to take a little bit of time at the beginning. We're going to go quicker towards the end here because we're covering two chapters. I'll get to summary mode in a moment here. So verse 1 says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, I don't even know how to say it, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. That's not the current uh, Herod that just killed uh, James, but this is a previous one, and Saul. So these are the prophets and teachers at the church of Antioch. Now I want to pause for a moment because Antioch, I want to highlight as you're studying scripture and you, you say Antioch, well, what is the Antioch? Antioch is a city. And where else have we seen Antioch? If we back up, and I'm gonna, I've done the work for you here, to chapter 11, just a couple chapters previously, in verse 19, it says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed. So let me pause. In the first part of Acts at the beginning of this year, we saw that Stephen, doing nothing wrong, is killed for his faith, the first martyr that we have record that is killed as a Christian simply for preaching Jesus. And when that happened, Saul, also known as, good job, Paul, uh, Saul is there. He's not a believer in Jesus. He's giving his approval to, to Stephen's death. God radically changes Saul's life in chapter 9, and now he's a 100% believer is part of the church. He's just doing his best to go to the ends of the earth as he knows, okay? So when that persecution broke out, people traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews, okay? Acts just a little bit farther in that same chapter. It says, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So now Barnabas and Saul are here at the church in the city of Antioch. For a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples, I left this in there, it's so cool, were, called, were first called Christians in Antioch. So if you ever wonder why we're called Christians, it means Christ follower. And they were referred to in Antioch as Christians. So cool little fact there. So that's why we still are referred to as Christians today. We are following Christ. So here they are in Antioch. Pick back up in verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now I want to highlight just some things in this chapter that relate to why we do missions the way we do today. And number one, we see God's unique call. As I've kind of already set it up, God just says in these very profound moments in our life, I choose you, I have a special task for your life. Now let me talk about this for a moment because if you're like me, you would assume that God knows what he's doing, that he's going to pick the best of the best of the best, right? Like that person that has God's unique call, they're like the cream of the crop, the creme la creme. I think I'm saying that right, right? Like they are qualified. They have every, every talent and everything they need. 
uh, to do the job at hand. To which we go, sure, right. But I'm not sure that's the way they felt when they were chosen. We don't have this in this particular part of scripture where Saul and Barnabas had any moment of hesitation, but we have a lot of examples in the Bible, right? Going back to Abraham, going back to Moses. Moses basically said, you have made a mistake, Lord. I am the wrong person. I can't speak. I stumble. And he literally said, send someone else. And so that's always a fun prayer. I'm sure God appreciates that, right? So I'm not sure they felt that way. But if we do assume that this is correct, that God knows what he's doing, and he has the the perfect person chosen, then we should also assume that if he chooses you, that he knows what he's doing, that he hasn't made a mistake, that you are perfectly qualified to do the task at which God's called you to. Because if you weren't, and he asked you to do something you cannot do, he would be unfair and unjust. And we don't see that anywhere in scripture, do we? So we can, here's maybe the more appropriate way to assume this, that if God calls us, knowing that we're the perfect person and we don't feel qualified, what do you think's about to happen? He's about to qualify you, right? <laughs> He's he's about to give you everything you need. I love the analogy. It's it's stayed with me for decades. I've shared this several times before, but there's a true story of a mom who wanted to inspire her young son to in piano playing. So she took him to the great uh, master pianist concert. But while they were waiting, she was talking with somebody on her left, and her son slipped up and went to the stage and started playing chopsticks. And so she's like realizing, oh my goodness, my, that's my son. She's embarrassed. And, you know, people are like, you know, get this kid off the stage. Well, the master pianist quickly understands what's happening, comes out there and comes around the boy and begins to improvise and play this beautiful rendition of Chopsticks. And what I love about that is sometimes, most of the time, I feel like my skill set is the equivalent of Chopsticks on the piano. And what God does is he comes around us and he fills in every gap and makes beautiful where we lack. Amen? Isn't that a good illustration? I love that. I just always see the Lord coming behind me and say, I got you. I got you. I know where where your uh, limits are. And I'm going to fulfill everything around you. He knows what he's doing. We don't always feel that God has chosen correctly that he's overlooked some significant parts of our resume. And I don't think that Paul and Barnabas knew everything that was about to happen, but they knew the God of which they served and they trusted him. And they said, if God called us, then he knows we have what it takes to do everything he's called us to do. Amen? So I like to say it this way, to those who God calls, he will also prepare You can say it a different way. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Amen. (laughs) Good stuff. So this, their only preparation from the scripture, here's, here's the extent of their preparation. They fasted and they prayed. (laughs) Some of you, that's just a good key for us. If God's called you and you feel inadequate, just start fasting and praying. And that's all you need. (laughs) Many missionaries that we support, when they feel called of God, don't feel like they have everything they need. In fact, most don't even know the language they're called to. It's not like they've studied and they're proficient and they're like, oh, thank you, God. You're just sending me where it's easy. (laughs) They just, they step into the mission field unprepared. In fact, as you talk to most missionaries, they say the hardest part is learning the language. Mark Rodley, which was here not too long ago, was saying the the word Mao (laughs) five different ways, and it means different things. One is a dog, one's a doctor. So you can call your doctor a dog or call your, uh, I mean, it's just crazy. Just, it's the pronunciation, very hard languages to, to study. They feel very unprepared. Let's jump back into our scripture in verse four. Now being called of God, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. I want to pause there. They're off on their adventure, not knowing what to expect, what they're going to encounter, 
simply trusting Jesus. But here's where we see now a unique strategy. I'm going to go a little bit quicker here uh, in summarizing this text because there was a unique strategy that we don't necessarily get from the Holy Spirit, but we see that everywhere Paul and Barnabas went, and, and I'll, I'll highlight it in from verse 4. Okay, The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, sailed there from Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. So here they go to a Jewish synagogue every single place they go. And they also preach to Gentiles. You see the same pattern in all of these chapters. Their culture and audience was mostly to Jewish people. They knew the scripture. Most, if not all Jewish boys, had memorized the first five books of the Old Testament before they were in age 12. And so you're going, they knew a lot of the scriptures. The, the history, the stories were passed down from one family member to the next. That's what joy the parents had in passing on their culture and their Jewish heritage. So when Paul and Barnabas are going to, uh, they, would, they would have this structure to go to the Jewish synagogues first, but they would also preach to Gentiles. Missionaries today still do the same thing. We factor in the culture in which they're going to and try to relate to them from their unique understanding and perspective of the world. It's like as an American going to another country to assume that America's culture is the right culture and we're trying to change the culture. They're not trying to change the culture. They're trying to bring Jesus to their culture. And they contextualize the gospel. These principles are just as true in America as they are in Asia, in Africa, no matter what continent you go to. Amen? The gospel is true. In fact, it's not even American gospel. It's a Jewish gospel, isn't it? That's the original culture. And Paul and Barnabas contextualize it not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. And so we see that pattern. So not only was there a unique call of God on their life and did they have a unique strategy, but there was some unique obstacles, okay? Um, You'll catch the word unique in all of this. Here's where I'm gonna summarize because right in as they get to their first uh, location, there's a guy named Bar-Jesus. The Bible calls him a Jewish sorcerer and also a false prophet. He opposes Paul and Barnabas. He tries to turn the proconsul, that was like a, a ruler of their time, from the faith. Paul rebukes him and pronounces blindness over him, and it happens. That's, I just love the Bible. It's cool stories. But they also find that many Jews will not accept the message. In fact, um, jealousy, there was jealousy from religious leaders. In chapter 13, verse 44 and 45, it says, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. So they're stirring up some attention, Paul and Barnabas. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Uh, A little bit later in chapter 14, some of those Jews tried to stone Paul and Barnabas. Um, That's like throwing giant rocks at them to kill them, just in case you weren't sure on what that stone meant in the Bible, okay? (laughs) So there was some opposition In fact, many of our missionaries that uh, we support go knowing there's opposition coming, knowing there's obstacles that they're going to face. Now, it's always great. And what most missionaries do is they come here and they share the great stories, don't right? Because you want to like, here's what God is doing. Here's how we've been successful. And we go, yay! Until you hear stories like Jim Elliott. And if you're not familiar, um, he was killed on the mission field. Yay, God, (laughs) right? You called him to preach to a tribe in Africa that's never heard once the name of Jesus and they killed him. Thank you, thank you for sending me, Lord. (laughs) Or how about Daryl and Cheryl Beebe? We've had them here and they've shared their story. They went to the islands of Palau and they were brutally beaten and raped. In their home. We've had a female share several years ago um, whose name I cannot say over the internet, but she was single on the field, also raped. Tragedy. Like you go, God, why? 
and all the things that we throw up there. Let me just say that in every one of these stories, there are redeeming things that they themselves will share that have happened since these tragedies have taken place. But many of our missionaries face difficult obstacles on the mission field. And what is encouraging, (laughs) if there is an encouraging part, is that Paul and Barnabas face the same thing. That's, That's the example we see. It's not always the joyful and amazing stories that we want to hear or need to hear. But we can see this happening in the book of Acts. In fact, one of the things Paul says to the church while he's on this missionary journey to encourage them, he said, take courage, brothers and sisters. We will face many persecutions in this life. So let's just let that encourage you today, right? So there were unique obstacles, but with every unique obstacle, there's also unique opportunities. And that's what we have to remember. We don't have a specific number, but I love the, it says many people came to faith in Jesus through their missionary journey. Let me just highlight a few passages. Acts 13, 49 through 52 says, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. It seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Like these two things shouldn't go on. Shouldn't happen at the same time. But they faced persecution and they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In chapter 14, it says that at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But those who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord. And I love this part. Who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. God says, I'm going to confirm your message of who I am by allowing you to do miracles. Of course, that's right after that, they wanted to stone him, okay? So they flee. But in the next few verses, it says, in Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth, had never walked in his life. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. God just uses them powerfully. And because of that, and it doesn't give us a number, but a great number of people believed. And that is why our missionaries, they know there's going to be obstacles. While they're willing to go is because they also know there's going to be opportunities to make a difference, even if it's in that one person's life. I mentioned mentioned Jim Elliott. He dies without a single convert. But his wife and his kids, think about this. His wife and his kids pick up where he left off and continue to witness to this tribe. And over time, they see an entire tribe come to faith in Jesus. Come on, isn't that amazing? Still to this day, generations now are serving God because of him. Paul himself says it this way. This is in a different book, not in the book of Acts. But he says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. In other words, what is Paul saying? He's like, I am compelled to preach. He he says, I have to do this because God has called me to do it. It's what he has assigned to my life. And if you talk to missionaries and you're like, why would you go through that? Why would you do that? And they said, I have to. I have to. They're passionate. They cannot do anything else and be satisfied with their life. It's how I feel about my call to be a pastor. Most missionaries have to go because they've been compelled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And last, they gained a unique testimony. I love this. Just catch this. Acts 14, 26 through 28 says, From Italia, they sailed back, say it with me, to, the scripture's not on the screen, to Antioch. What did they do? Full circle. Where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together 
and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed a long time with the disciples. This is why we have our missionaries come back. Because as we support them, as we pray for them, we also want to hear from them, don't we? We want to hear what God is doing. We want to hear not only the opportunities, but also the obstacles and how God has showed up. And I love that. God gives them a testimony as he does for each one of us. As Daniel and Aaron will come back, they're going to come back with a testimony of how they got to impact, even if it's one life or one family or a hundred. I don't know. I'm excited to hear how God uses them. But God gives us a testimony. And you know what happens? Everyone's encouraged. I don't know about you, but some of the highlights as a pastor is, to hearing, is hearing from our missionaries who are coming back to report of the faithfulness of our God. Amen? So let me just say, we're the sent ones. This is an example for us. In Acts chapter 13 and 14, it was Paul and Barnabas. But in 2024, it's each one of us. We're the sent ones. As you look at scripture, God sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit sends us to a world that desperately needs Jesus. God is still sending people. And that's why as I've asked you to pray during this message, what is he saying to you? And maybe a better question for some of you to wrestle with is, are you willing to go should he call you to go? If you're a Christian, you are called. It's not a question, are you called? You are called and you've already been sent. Called to what exactly? Sent to where? We need to lean into the Holy Spirit and ask. This is where the command to go into all the world, to go into all the nations, we both get to figure it out ourselves, what that means, whether that's our work, our neighborhood, just our daily lives. And we say, Holy Spirit, are you sending me to something greater? Are you sending me to something specific? Mission is not something we go do. It's not simply being involved with a mission team. Mission is something we are. We are called. We have been set apart. And we are already sent on mission to this world. So you don't have to pray about that. You just pray about where and when and how. Jesus said, the Father has sent me, so I am now sending you. The impulse of the gospel is to move outward. It's never inward. It's never us for no more. It's always an outward impulse. In every page of every scripture, in every church, if you think I care about growth because of my pride, I don't. I care about growth because that is the point of the gospel. That's the only point of why we're still on this earth is to reach more people for Jesus. That's why we gather. That's why we encourage each other. That's why he has sent us out. The mission of God can be summarized with go and tell. Go and tell. Go and tell of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. I wanna to conclude today just to highlight, there's really three ways. Three ways as a Christian, as a person that we support the mission of God. This is not pick one. This is all of the above, okay? So this is just the simplest way I can summarize it. Number one, we pray. What are we praying for? I've already said, Jesus said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth labors. So we're not only praying that God would continue to send people, we're also praying, are you sending me? Isaiah says it this way, here am I, Lord, send me. I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go. I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. So we pray, we pray for our missionaries who have gone. We are asking the Holy Spirit if he's sending us that God would continue to send forth labors. The second thing we do is we give. Most of us are here this morning in Vancouver, North Creek Church, unless you've come from another country and you are a missionary to Vancouver and God does that still too, doesn't he? That means that we haven't gone. 
So we're going to give. We're going to give as generous as we can. Now, let me just remind you that tithe, it means 10%. That goes to the church. That goes to keep the church alive, to help us function. Above and beyond that, that's where the generosity kicks in. That's where we go. Missions is one thing. Sometimes it's a food pantry. Sometimes it's uh, Options 360, helping just uh, teenagers who find themselves in an uncomfortable place and pregnant. That's where we are helping the homeless situation, doing our part, helping this community, both locally and globally. Above and beyond, we're saying we're giving. And we give to send missionaries to make it possible for those who have said yes, like Selby Ranger, who's a part of this church. He's like, he he wants to get back so bad, so bad. And we're just praying for him to do that. But the last thing is we go. And that's where the real challenge is. Perhaps God has been speaking or stirring up. Perhaps you even felt that call as a little child, but life has taken you just to where you are and you've kind of let go of that but it's still in there, it's still nagging you. Where do you think God calls people from? Calls them from just the local congregation as they're fasting and they're praying and the Holy Spirit just says, I pick you, I'm choosing you. I have a a task for you. I I have a ministry for your life. And if you feel unqualified and inadequate, you're in the right spot because God knows how to get you where you need to go. Would you stand with me? And let's just pray. Let's pray. I dare you to pray. Holy Spirit, we're asking, are you sending us? We're already praying. We're going to continue to pray. We're already giving. We're going to continue to give. But we're asking specifically, How are you sending us? Do you have an assignment for us? Do you have a task? And before you give clarity with as much faith as we can muster, we're going to say in advance, our answer is yes, that you will figure out a way to prepare us, to provide for us everything we need, to put us on the right path and task at hand. So Holy Spirit, I just pray at North Creek, that you would continue to send people out, send people to start other churches, send people to start other organizations, send people, Lord, that the kingdom of God would grow, that your kingdom on this earth, that people's lives would be changed for eternity because Holy Spirit is working in this church, in this congregation, in our lives, sending us to the nations. And we thank you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen and amen. God bless you. I hope you're challenged and encouraged. We'll see you next week. Say hi to some people around.